and welcome back to my channel. My name is Cole Anderson, and today we're finishing up my three-part series on the Gershwin Piano Concerto in F. Please be sure to check out the first two movements as well if you haven't seen them already. I've linked to those videos in the description box below. Uh, please do consider supporting this channel financially as well if you're able to. You can do that either by making a recurring pledge through Patreon.com. Uh, it's www.patreon.com forward slash independent pianist or you can also make a one-time donation through paypal.com. Any amounts, very much appreciated. And I also just wanted to say thank you to all my current supporters. I couldn't do this without you. If you're not ready to make a financial contribution, just like the video, subscribe, and please leave a comment and let me know what you think. So in many ways, this last movement of the Concerto in F is one of my very favorite Gershwin pieces. It just so perfectly encapsulates his contribution to the piano concerto form. A very unique contribution, by the way. Of course, we saw that in the first movement, he had a very ambitious sonata form-like movement where he altered the form a little bit so that the development section operated more along the lines of variation form. Then in the second movement, there was a very unique kind of rondo form where the different sections contained kernels of the new material from the next section. So in the B section, for instance, the theme for the C section appeared in a very basic kind of form. In the second movement, Gershwin also recalled the opening notes of the first piano cadenza from the first movement, thereby introducing the idea that the entire piece might be motivically interconnected, that it might be in fact a cyclic work along the lines of Schubert, Liszt, and Franck. And the last movement makes it clear that that is indeed the case. The last movement, first off, is based on a theme that makes prominent use of repeated notes. And this theme was first sketched by Gershwin as a small fragment that was probably intended to be a prelude. It's not always well known, but Gershwin originally intended to write 24 preludes, much in the style of Chopin's 24 preludes, which he admired greatly, but of course he only ever completed three. But he used this little fragment at the beginning of this third movement, and the interesting thing about it is that the fragment is in G minor, and of course the key of the entire concerto is F. So Gershwin, in a really cheeky and irreverent move, just starts the last movement in G minor, which doesn't really make sense from the standpoint of harmonic relationships. It would be far more normal if the last movement just began in F minor, but it's actually a brilliant touch because it's exactly a sound that we're not quite expecting. So it makes the surprise of the opening of the last movement after this very drawn out and poetic second movement even more shocking. And in a typically brilliantly irreverent fashion, Gershwin just sidesteps from G minor into F minor when the piano enters with the theme. So in a rondo form, of course, as you might be familiar from previous videos where we had rondos, is one where there's a refrain, so usually called an A theme, which is then interspersed with other ideas. So it usually would look something like A, B, A, C, A, D, A, etc., etc., however many themes you wanted to have. But in this rondo, almost every time there's a new theme, it's actually a transformation of a theme from either the first or second movements. So the B section is the first theme from the first movement, which also happens to focus on repeated notes. This ties it into the last movement very strongly. The D section is the beautiful lyrical melody from the second movement, which I consider to really be the heart of the whole concerto. It's very moving when it re returns in this last movement. And the E section is the other kind of jaunty, whimsical tune from the second movement. Now, where Gershwin really makes a unique contribution to the form here is that the C section is actually a completely new melody. It's a kind of a jazzy theme, and this thematic idea keeps coming back. It kind of infiltrates the structure in between the later sections acting as a kind of foil, a major key foil to the minor key opening theme. And it takes over the structure to such an extent that at the end, the very last thing that you hear is a little cadenza which is based on the first few notes of this kind of jazzy theme. And the whole piece is transformed into radiant major key and it ends in a blaze of glory. Along the way, though, there are more explicit connections to the first movement. So the very opening bass drum fanfare idea that opens the very first movement comes back in a couple of places, in the middle of the movement and also at the end, very obviously. Also, there's a verbatim repeat of the big climactic passage from the first movement as well. It comes back, it's extremely exciting when it returns 
almost exactly as it was in the first movement. So I hope you do enjoy this performance. Uh, I think to get the full genius of this last movement, it's really great to hear it in context with the other movements. It's wonderful on its own, but it becomes even more astonishing how brilliant it is when you realize how it ties everything together in the whole piece. So I'm also going to upload a video with just the performance of all three movements, so if you wish to, you can hear them back to back. So I hope you enjoy listening to this piece as much as I have enjoyed playing it, and I hope to see you next week for some more music. Thanks for watching. See you next time.